Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to day three of this incredible webinar series. Um, before we get things kicked off and as people trickle in, we're going to begin with the video that sets up the week long conversation. <music> Cities across Canada are looking for smart solutions to our housing affordability crisis. Hiding in plain sight is a generational opportunity to add missing middle housing to our residential neighborhoods as an alternative to condo buildings or relying on environmentally harmful urban sprawl to provide large family homes. Potentially the fastest, least disruptive, and most cost-effective type of missing middle housing is at the smaller scale, adding one or more units to an existing single-family house and its yard. These types of homes are becoming more familiar in our neighborhoods. Garden suites. Laneway homes. Adding suites within the house. Or dividing a house into multiple units. Our residential neighborhoods, made up mostly of single-family houses, occupy the majority of land in our city regions, offering great capacity to add new housing supply quickly to areas where we already have roads, transit, schools and health clinics, many other services and local businesses, and walkable communities. A recent study by the Urban Land Institute estimates that adding one unit to 15% of houses in Toronto would be equal to adding at least 100 condo towers. The question is, can this type of housing supply help with affordability and equity? Many municipalities are already rolling out these programs, including Toronto, but early evidence indicates that these programs are not generating affordable housing, but rather homes that are at market rate, great for more housing supply, but not necessarily for affordability. In some cities, where these programs have been in place for a few years now, the uptake by homeowners has been disappointingly low, even at market rate. House conversions and laneway houses are costly, and the process is onerous to navigate. So how can we design better programs and policies to deliver affordable units? For instance, can we reduce the costs of construction with, well, less construction? Instead of completely gutting houses and rebuilding them, can we develop pre-approved plans to add suites to the existing dwelling or replicable backyard homes and scale a renovation revolution? Can we create a municipal one-stop shop that provides everything the homeowner needs, from a local labor pool to innovative financial tools and a barrier-free process? Can the National Housing Strategy help roll out pilot projects in Canadian cities to encourage uptake and test new programs that benefit homeowners while yielding affordable units? Can we ensure that these programs are equitable and truly inclusive? Join the School of Cities, City Building TMU, and ULI Toronto for a four-part webinar series to explore these and other solutions to create an affordable renovation revolution. Learn more and sign up for the series at affordablemissingmiddle.ca. Once again, good afternoon, everybody. And obviously, you are the folks who did sign up uh, to register for today. So welcome to you all. My name is Richard Joy, Executive Director of ULI Toronto. Welcome to day three of this week's long, uh, this week-long series um, that has been organized and curated by the U of T School of Cities and City Building TMU, the Toronto Metropolitan University. ULI is proud to host this series on our platform to attract many of our members, as well as the constituencies of both of these academic institutions. Before we get into this, as always, we begin with a land acknowledgement. As uh, Toronto region-based organizations, we acknowledge that the land we are meeting on, virtually, is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nation, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, and newcomers in this generation or generations past. 
ULI Toronto stands in solidarity with Indigenous communities demanding action and accountability for the ongoing legacy of the residential school system. We also like to acknowledge and honour those who come here involuntarily, particularly descendants from those who were brought here through enslavement. To better understand the meaning behind this land acknowledgement, we recommend four programs that we have uploaded to YouTube. These links will be made available in the chat. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Cherise Berta, Executive Director of City Building at the Toronto Metropolitan University, TMU, who will be our webinar moderator for this afternoon. Um, Cherise's bio and all the bios of our speakers today will be provided in the chat just to make for a more efficient uh, uh, hour. Um, before I hand it over to Cherise, I want to make a uh, note to our audience that ULI is a nonpartisan organization and we do not advocate on public policy, pro or con. We frequently take a critical look at public policy and the landscape uh, in the context of advancing our global mission, which we'll put into the link. Uh, and so that is the context of today's series. Um, we're encouraging people to bring questions through the Q&A box. Um, we will do our best to answer those questions within this hour. Um, but if we fail to do so, and we may, depending on how many questions come in, especially, um, there is a, a going to be a, a final report um, of the week um, that will also look at those questions, answered or unanswered, in attempt to get to more of them than, than we may have time to do today. So with that, Cerise, I uh, will ask you to take it over. Thank you so much, Richard. And thanks to everyone for coming back and joining us again today for part three of our series. So I hope you saw the first two panels. They were so educational and really exciting. And one of the things I learned from yesterday's panel was that in California, accessory dwelling units or secondary suites currently make up 20% of their new housing supply, which is astounding. And it took only five years to get to that level. And um, Denise uh, from California actually for, referred to it as the ADU revolution. So I think we're on the right track here um, for this series. Um, however, in, yesterday, in yesterday's uh, panel, um, they also mentioned that financing is still a big challenge for homeowners to create a secondary suite. So today we are moving forward with the show me the money part of the series. And so I'm grateful to have such a fantastic panel to navigate the finance question. As always, the full bios of our panelists will be popped in the chat as I introduce each of them, starting with Kira Gerwing, Chief Real Estate Investment Officer with Satcha Investments, Grayson Johnson, Senior Specialist Innovation and Research CMHC, Marcel Gros, who's the co-founder of Ownably, and Stuart Dutfield, Manager, Environment and Climate Division, City of Toronto. So great to see everybody again today. And um, next slide, please. So on Monday, we were introduced to the missing little, the opportunity to add units to the single family house itself or on its parcel of land. And Monday's panel of architects explained how rather than totally demolishing and rebuilding a home, renovating a home, and adding simple, well-designed units can bring down construction costs. Next slide. So these numbers really stood out from Michael Piper's presentation on Monday. He presented four options to add missing middle. And to the far right, you see that with the renovations to create a triplex instead of tearing down the house, it's actually possible to get closer to affordability. And Michael also mentioned the carbon benefits of not demolishing the home. So this approach results in the lowest per square foot of the four options presented, which translates into lower rent required to make a profit, which is a great thing. So next slide, please. So perhaps it's possible to make the numbers work for the homeowner with reduced construction costs, uh, the simplified plans that are pre-approved and repeatable and solving the barriers that we talked about yesterday. But even if all this is achievable, the question still remains, why would a homeowner still wanna go through a disruptive re 
renovation and not charge as much rent as they can. So we're going to um, discuss that question. And let's get started with our panel. And I want to kick things off with Grayson. Um, Grayson, can you set things up and help us understand what's currently available right now to a homeowner in Canada in the form of grants or loans or anything like that um, to add a unit to their existing dwelling or a garage suite or a lean waste suite? Thank you so much, Cherise. I love this series and I'm so grateful to be a part of it. So thank you to U of T and ULI and TMU. This is a wonderful discussion. So in this area, uh, the quick answer is not much. And what I've really come to respect as an observer of this space for a long time is how difficult this is from a policy perspective. It is a very difficult needle to thread because we have this conundrum where, as you've rightly pointed out, these are some of the lowest cost and most desirable units that are available to us in the housing uh, ecosystem. And yet there is this real financial barrier to creating them. However, when we are using public funds, whether if that's at a municipal or provincial or federal level, when we spend public funds on housing, there are always terms and conditions in, involved to ensure affordability, accountability, um, social benefit. And that level of administration doesn't translate very well to smaller projects. And so uh, what you do see are some programs at a municipal level that might be a grant or a tax rebate or a forgivable loan like uh, Toronto has with their affordable laneway, laneway suites program. And um, at the federal level, what really is the financial benefit is that when we calculate, this is going to be quite technical, but when we calculate um, our debt service ratios in Canada, you're actually allowed to use um, your rent, uh, the rent that you're collecting from those extra units to essentially make you um, uh, to change your debt ratio so that you can access a, a greater mortgage, which is a long way of saying that um, you're able to access mortgage loan insurance for projects that have ADUs in them. This is only for purchase. It's not for refinance. We don't do re refinance loans anymore. So what I have observed over the years is that the main financial barrier is or benefit is actually in removing barriers. And so cities that are doing this are making sure that these types of projects fly through the approvals process. Um, City of Windsor has done a really good job of trying to make that happen. So same with City of Kitchener. A lot of municipalities, I'm sure many are on this call, are learning from each other to figure out how can we make this easy for people. Um, City of Edmonton has a how-to guide and a video. Uh, at the provincial level, uh, the Ontario government for years now has actually required that cities are permit uh, you to have two ADUs on your property. BC has plans to do the same. So we have our, our two provinces with the, the greatest housing uh, shortage that are essentially saying every single family uh, lot in their provinces should be allowed to have a, a triplex on it in the form of a couple ADUs. So that's a way of making that happen. And in Ontario, you're not allowed to charge development fees on that. And so that's a financial benefit. And of course, federally, we have um, we have that way to access uh, a lower down payment by accessing that, that mortgage loan insurance. So it is a tricky thing. And I, I really appreciated Marcel's thoughts on this of how difficult it is to involve public money in terms of uh, a direct grant or rebate. And I, I should also mention there is a brand new uh, multi-generational home renovation uh, tax credit that's up to $7,500. But again, there are terms and conditions. It's got to be for um, a senior family member or a an adult uh, relative with a disability. And, and that's the lay of the land there. Oh my goodness. I'm going to have to go back. <laughs> I'm gonna have to, I'm, you're going to have to stop me because I love this topic and we could go on. We're going to have to have a fireside chat just with you. So um, that is so interesting. So I take away, there's like lots of little bits and pieces with lots of conditions and strings attached. And those strings aren't necessarily bad, um, but it's like a whole process of getting there and solving all these other things. And then we can get to scale. And if we can get to scale, then we can get to the bigger money. Maybe. <laughs> so I like how you did like the segue to Marcel. Um, let's hear it from you. Um, how well do these various options pencil out for homeowners and cit citizen developers? Like, can these um, many things um, 
either on their own or combined, can they yield a profit or a meaningful revenue? Do the costs facilitate charging market rent or above market rent, or is it possible to get affordable unit in there? Yeah, no, um, great, great question. Um, a, a little bit loaded, so let's let's try to break this down a bit. Um, I think uh, just to kind of set the 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 tone of the question, and and I, I do want to address the elephant in the room, and the elephant in the room is the unintended consequence of, you know, like you know this as of right um, zoning, what it could what it could provide and what it could cause, um, and what I'm even seeing in in the market, um, you know, from from private investors and. And what's happening is, um, you know, because of the house prices and, you know, the cost and difficulty of doing these types of uh, renovations to create, you know, three units or four units, um, investors need to create a yield um, invariably. So what's happening is um, individuals are going in, buying these properties. You know, the, the last one I saw was a semi and the numbers were unbelievable. They're renting them out furnished. Um, you know, basement apartments starting at like $3,000. Um, and, you know, I walked through, I happened to, you know, I know one of the individuals, you know, that was doing this and I'm part of a, you know, this underground community of investors. And it, it was like, you know, you walk through this, it's a semi-detached in like, you know, Leslieville-esque area. And it was unbelievable, right? Like the basement starting at 3000 So um, I think... You know that's that's something that we need to consider from a policy perspective. Like, how do we avoid? Because that essentially pulls you know market units out of you know off the market. Um, like, I couldn't even afford to live in the basement. Um, you know, most of us here probably as well. So, I think that's something to consider. As far as like penciling out, um, you know, I, I ran some back of the napkin numbers, and you know, you could start. It's it starts to make sense around a fourplex. Um, you know, if policy could allow, you know, a four plus a laneway um, or, or a garden, it's, it, it can start to get really interesting. Um, you know, where you place that unit is likely on a fourplex going to be your basement. Um, that's going to be your 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 least, um, the unit that generates the least amount of income. Um, but, you know, we ran some numbers kind of like, you know, I'm looking at my napkin here, like 1350 for a two bedroom basement which would be, you know, based on CMHC's kind of rents, 80% um, of CMHC's average market rents, which are about like 50% of the market. Um, so, so it starts to be pretty affordable. Um, now that said, in order to do that, what I had to do with my numbers is I had to, you know, shoot the lights out on my two bedroom that's on the main floor and my ADU, and all those will likely have to be, you know, furnished or a mixture of furnished and market, right? So, so I get my I get my higher yields on those you know those more desirable units maybe with a walkout balcony or whatever, um, and then I'm able to to kind of slot in this this affordable unit. And I think there's something I think the 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 long and short is two things that I've learned from this. Um, just quick exercise. Um, the first thing is there's hope, right? Um, I think there's 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 hope and there's there's hope for this kind of citizen developer to go in there and and do this because that's another angle to look at it. And the second thing is, I think when the citizen developer goes in, they really have to underwrite this from an investor perspective, meaning that, you know, it's a pretty big investment. I didn't talk about the amount of money, but, you know, it's a, it's a pretty large number to get in and, and do these renovations. You want to make sure that you can exit and you're doing whatever you're doing that provides you an exit. Um, and, and I think if you do those two things, um, you know, there's there's definitely, you know, hope for the, for these types of units to create some sort of affordable unit. Um, and maybe, you know, there's from a policy perspective, there's some benefit to those citizen investors doing so. Super helpful and sobering. <laughs> Thanks, Marcel. Um, I have um, a um, pre-ready question for you, Kira, but I wanna go off the script for a bit um, and respond a little bit um, to Marcel's points. Because one of the things that I took away from the first two panels was, um, the first panel was, yeah, you can actually do these renovations that are really simple and cost effective. Like we saw the numbers that Michael ran um, and they're pretty achievable, right? Um, it looked like those, those market or the, the rents would, would actually be below market rate. Um, the second thing um, we learned from yesterday is that the ADU program 
in California um, appears to be um, embraced by the actual homeowner who lives in the home and they add the ADU and um, it either one or two, um, but a lot of just ones. And then, but the, the, the deal there is it's scaled. It's scaled. And like you guys are saying, you have all of the systems in place, right? It's like creating that homeowner one-stop shop, the ecosystem, you, you can get everything done and it's easy and it's scalable. So is there like is there a different outcome if we have you know a, a scale where homeowners are actually adding a unit or two units? Um, Kira, I'm gonna throw that to you, but I also want to ask the question that I had all written out for you. <laughs> you can say no, and I'll give you the other one. Other one. No, that's great, and thank you. It's so nice to be here. I'm actually hailing from the uh, traditional territories of the Squamish, Tsleil Tooth, and Musqueam nations today. Uh, commonly known as Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, one of the least affordable cities in Vancou in, in Canada. Um, uh, lots of single family homes here. So the maps that were shown in the video up front are, are, it's definitely something that we're battling here. We're also looking at densification of family, uh, single family lots here. Uh, we're actually going to five units, uh, Marcel. There are some uh, really interesting small builders, small home builders uh, that are that are coming up with some really innovative designs to get five units on a standard 33 foot by 120 foot lot in, in our city, which might be worth looking at for folks who are interested. Um, so where I come from, in answer to your question, Sharice, about you know, the, the outcomes that we're looking for, and if we're talking about scale, it, you, you you kind of have to do a little bit of math to think if we converted, what, what is the effort to convert every single single family lot in a city like Vancouver or Metro Toronto? Um, what's the effort required to convert every single family lot from one unit to four or five units versus looking at every community owned parcel of land in an urban center and creating incentives to redevelop community owned land uh, for purpose built rental housing. And I will just disclose that, that like my, my penchant is for the latter because uh, the, the, the kind of another elephant in the room, and I'm sure there are plenty others too that we'll uncover over the course of our conversation, but another elephant in the room is when you are a private landowner, you are incentivized by margin. When you're a community landowner, you're incentivized by mission. And uh, when you have a, a mission-driven incentive versus a margin-driven incentive, my, my belief is that your public dollar invested is going to go further in a mission-driven development than it would in a margin-driven development. So I just put that out there for conversation. And then to say, you know, the effort required when you're a public institution that's either enabling development through land use policy or through, you know, uh, slipstreaming uh, pre-designed uh, pre-designed uh, authorizations or, or uh, permissions to develop through, um, you know, how much of that effort is in incentivizing and then how much of that in effort is in enforcing on the other end. So Grayson mentioned this in her opening remarks too, like how much of it is about, you know, then making sure that the requirements of the rules that were developed around the program are actually upheld. And is that, I, I do kind of sometimes wonder if that's how we want to spend our time enforcing rules some ideas to get the conversation going okay i'm going to come back to that i really want to start to talk about some of the um types of financial goodies that could be could make it attractive for homeowners to enter the program like they're doing in california um, at that scale but Stuart, i want to jump over to you because you um you can tell us about local improvement charges as how, how they work for energy retrofits. And I'm wondering, is there a way that this type of um, financial tool could be applied to both, both adding an affordable unit to the principal dwelling and with green retrofits? And would it be possible to keep the numbers at the price point that we saw um, in Michael's analysis that I showed earlier? 
Yeah, well, uh, well, thank you very much for having me, everyone. Uh, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, so just to give people a little bit of background, so LICs or PACE, so PACE in the U.S. is, is the typical term, so it's property assessed clean energy finance. Um, in Canada, in Ontario, and other, other um, uh, regions across the country, uh, local improvement charges or LICs uh, are enabled by, you know, regulation at the provincial level. And essentially what it is, it is, um, it allows, in Toronto's case, the municipality to finance projects on individual properties. Um, in our case, we have the Home Energy Loan Program, and how that works is an applicant would apply to us. Um, we would provide them funding to do energy and water improvements on their house. Um, and what they would do, they would complete the work, they would provide all the receipts to us, and then what we do is essentially create a bylaw, and through the property tax uh, collection system, they then pay that uh, they pay that money back to us. Um, what is unique about this is that the LIC is not tied to the individual. It's actually tied to the property. Um, and so it's a model that has, has been used extensively in the U.S., particularly in California. Um, it has been used in, in Canada uh, quite a bit as well, just in different forms. Um, in Toronto, Halifax is a version of this. And actually, I just came from a conference yesterday where this has expanded across the country. So I think currently the focus is on figuring out um, how to grow this at scale in different regions across the country. Um, there's programs launching in British Columbia. There's programs coming in Alberta, whole suite of programs in the East Coast, et cetera. So currently that our program and others are, are focused on the, the question of energy efficiency and increasingly really on decarbonization. So how do you how do you decarbonize hundreds of thousands of homes in Toronto? Um, but I would say there is a lot of potential there um, to look at more interesting ways of doing this. Um, what we are seeing to, again, kind of recalling some of the things from the conference yesterday, is the question of equity and affordability are like really front of mind for, you know, ourselves at the city, but also other jurisdictions across the country, whether they be big, you know, big markets like Vancouver and Toronto or small little cities, which are all grappling with affordability issues in their own right. Um, so I'd say, yes, there's, there's certainly a potential there. Um, we're exploring those. We're seeing really interesting models coming out of the U.S. Uh, colleague just before this call actually sent me something that was their, their twist on it was sort of aging in place. And their twist was aging in place efficiently, which, again, is, I think, another component of this whole sort of affordable housing challenge, housing more generally. Yeah, I think you touched on it. How it's like very holistic because you know, you can just look at the retrofits as one element of being low carbon. But as we know, the, the low carbon benefits of getting more supply, housing supply in an existing home, um, you know, reduces all that embodied carbon from the big buildings and having to sprawl and being able to use our existing infrastructure and streets and transit. Like those things aren't factor, factored like immediately but you bring them all mm -hmm. together, plus affordability and aging in place. And you've got like this kind of triple, like the missing middle could be a triple middle. It could be like housing supply, exactly. check, affordability, check, green, check. So um, yeah. I think it is an interesting, so thanks for taking us through that. Cause I think it, it it's really interesting to hear that it's kind of opening up and thinking more broadly. So yeah, um, no, it's, it's Sorry, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry, I was going to say, just it, again, it, it's really interesting. And I think to your point, Sharice, it really speaks to how density is it also, a, a, is a, you know, it helps us limit the amount of carbon we want to be putting out into the atmosphere. It's done well, and it's done in a very considered and thoughtful manner. Yeah, I think there could be a super cool program where we add that to the mix. Um, Grayson, I want to go back over to you because I remember in um, my long conversation with you a couple of months ago, and you started sending me all of these. Um, um, articles and stuff like that. And I remember reading, uh, I think it was Greece, <laughs> where one of the jurisdictions that use tax credits for homeowners to keep at least one of their units under market rate. And I know in that context, it was, it was demolishing and building a new apartment building. But in the case of the missing little, where we want to add units and say we can add one or two units, or maybe even more in Marcel's case, um, what kind of like I mean you you mentioned that it's hard to create big financial tools for something that's this small but what do you think could be created um that's alternative to traditional home equity loans like um 
could there be a situation where you have a tax credit for homeowners to keep at least one of their units under market rate? And so then they would, the homeowner would generate the revenue um, from renting their properties plus get a tax credit. Um, and then there'd be some sort of price point that would be associated with it. And then you'd have to work at a whole bunch of other things. But do you think that this could work in Canada? And, and um, how could it work? Or, or do you think there's a, a totally better option? In terms of the feasibility and the political desirability of that, I just want to say that that is for our elected officials. So this is not something that I would really have um, the, uh, you know, an opinion on. That's something that we have to talk to our elected officials about if that's something that we would desire. What I do want to point out is how um, important the or how influential the market conditions are on whether or not certain policies would work. And one thing I wanted to pull out of the conversation between Marcel and Kira there is Kira was saying, you know, in, in BC and Vancouver, we've got we're going five units. And Marcel was talking about the um, financial feasibility of, you know, how many units do we need? A lot of that in this conversation is about, is it going to be for rent or is it going to be for sale? And something that is enabling a lot of this missing middle to happen in BC is they have different strata rules. And for those that are not from BC, stratification is what we call condoization in, in Ontario. I'm sure that there are many legal um, differences. So I apologize if someone knows the actual like detailed differences, but essentially in BC, it is possible and it is common for people to stratify or to um, sell off pieces of a smaller house. Whereas in Ontario, that's not something that you see very often. And this is a question I really have and I'm exploring in my own conversations and research. Um, because if you are able to, for example, convert into a fourplex or a fiveplex or a sixplex and sell off parts of those units, that completely changes the financing. It means that you are able to um, you're able to access a mortgage, and the way that people view a mortgage psychologically is different than how they they view rents. And so, a lot of these policy tools that we talk about are really subject to what are the market conditions that we're in, because it is not even in the U.S. I used to do most of my work with U.S. clients um, before I joined CMHC. The in the U.S rents work <laughs> rentals work in a lot of markets and a lot of cities there and um and so you can make you can make a living by creating rentals and small buildings and um and so that's something that i wanted to pull out is even if we have a tool uh that could technically work it really is going to be likely temporary based on the conditions that we're in and so i don't know that there is this one rule uh one ring to rule them all when it comes to the the housing policy or the mortgage policy here and that is going to take an act of parliament it's something that happens in the housing act so it's not something that we would be able to just procure out of um <laughs> out of our our ideas um i also wanted to uh, to note that the national housing strategy is actually doing a ton of work in this area that is not necessarily daylighted to people so people don't see how much um is happening where the first couple of discussions that you had about architecture you know pre-approved plans removing barriers there's a ton of work that i'm really lucky to be on the front row seat of that's happening through the innovation programs that are funded through the national housing strategy so things like um, there's a gentle density accelerator that is being funded through housing supply challenge in partnership with impact canada that's in bc and they're helping cities figure out their code to enable this they're specifically looking and saying like how can we make this happen and then they're creating a, a community of practice so that other mid-sized cities have access to that kind of knowledge and they're trying to understand what are the economics of doing this this you know one to six conversion on a single family lot how can we make that happen that's one example another is adusearch.ca which just launched so look it up adusearch.ca that's helping they've across 30 cities across the country you can look up uh, a lot, and it helps a homeowner figure out red light, green light, basically, if if their uh, lot is likely to support an ADU or not, and it helps remove a lot of the knowledge barrier there. And in doing so, they've also helped cities understand how they can streamline their code. Again, I can go on a lot. I know I'm over my time, so I'm just going to pass it back to you because otherwise I'll keep going. No, it's like super rich information, and there are so many great resources out there. And 
Um, like Richard mentioned, there's going to be a report at the end of this whole series, and we will um, hopefully include a lot of those things that you're mentioning, Grayson, because they're so important. Um, one of the things that you brought up was the national housing strategy, and I just kind of want to um, blue sky on that. Um, you know, I at one point a few months ago, I was doing some of my own envelope number crunching and came up with the typical um, below market rent um, unit from a new construction building. And it's not um, rent geared to income. It's just below like 80% um, market rent. And it looked like with all the numbers that I had, um, and someone can show me better numbers. It looked like it was somewhere between 600 and 700,000 to actually build that unit. And that's partnering with a developer and you know, giving all the density, giving all the market rate to the developer, and then you get a couple below market rent units out of it. You know, I've talked to some people who are like, you know what, we could actually, I need to look um, more closely at Michael's numbers, but I think that we could add an affordable unit, um, you know, order of magnitudes lower than that quantum, right? By adding a unit to an existing house with a renovation. And those types of things could be scaled and assume they're like 50,000 or 100,000 to build. Um, would that not be a type of program to invest money in um, for a number of reasons? It's faster to deploy, um, it's low carbon, um, it can happen all throughout our neighborhoods and um, ensure some equity. I mean, is it crazy thinking that a program like this could be supported by the national housing strategy in a way that they invest in it in sort of financing ways, um, but also to support um, rolling out some of those pilots that generate a, a, um, an affordable unit? Who wants to jump all over that? I can pop in and say that if people have ideas, they should submit them to the innovation fund <laughs> uh, and because that is for piloting um, innovative ways of, of making this finance happen and um, and also ensuring affordability. So if you have ideas that you wanted to, to model in that way, that would be the avenue to do it where we can learn and experiment. And um, if it works, then scale it. Others. Maybe, maybe I'll just I'll, I'll just weigh in as well and just say uh, there, there's sort of some um, kind of uh, fundamentals, right? So if you have to pay market rate for land, and then you have to pay market rate for construction, and then uh, you you can't you can't actually de develop a below market product, right? The like the the way that the the foundations of of the math work. So any incentive program has to be ad addressing some of those fundamentals around the cost of land, the cost of construction, and the cost of operating, right? So this low carbon solution, yes, you can reduce operating costs, but is it gonna be enough to actually tip the scale that those savings are borne by the, um, by the ultimate tenant? That's an interesting question, but my guess is that it's not going to tip the scale uh, that much in terms of affordability. Um, so then you have to start to think about, okay, if 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 there is going to be a private landowner who is interested in, let's use the term, vending their land in to participate in a collective affordable housing solution like this, what is the quid pro quo and what is a reasonable contribution from a, a, a public taxpayer administrate like it's it's our, it's our tax dollars that are going into it so what is what is a reasonable trade-off to ask from a private citizen for a public investment into their property i guess that's really what we're talking about here and then i'll just reiterate my former point which is that yes we can get to scale i'm not sure that it's easier to work with however many millions of single family homeowners it is before we tackle some of the higher density opportunities on community owned land. Think of every church, every school board owned property, every uh, nonprofit owned property. Like, but I, I just, uh, for me, I'm, I, I know I'm being a little bit of a provocateur and a different kind of bent on this, but my, my, my gut tells me that if, if we've got a limited amount of funding um, that's available from the government, trying to distribute that to many, 
um, for, for, for low density solutions, like one to five on a single family lot versus, you know, developing opportunities that are housing hundreds of people, hundreds of households at one time. Uh, I, 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 I'm leaning towards the latter. <laughs> okay, well, we'll talk to we'll talk to the folks in California who got 20% of their new housing supply from homeowners. Um, and I think it's just really interesting if there's um, the types of uh, financial incentives that they've been doing to get their homeowners, you know, through tax credits to, you know, deliver one of those units and then suddenly it's all over. Um, the state, which is really, really fantastic. But I'm going to change course and um, go back to you, Stuart. Um, if this type of affordable missing middle um, program is scaled, are there things like, because I'm interested in things like the, a revolving fund that shares the risk and revenue with homeowners and reinvests in more projects. Like I know that revolving funds are often associated with the with green building investment. Could something like this work in this case? Oh, I think you're on you. Such an amateur mistake, you know, three years into a pandemic, sorry, <laughs> double muting myself. Um, but I was gonna say, you know, I. I Something just to follow on what Kira said, I think too, there's this aspect of sort of friction too, like and and getting more bang for your your buck. Um, and so there's an administration friction that has to come out. And then it's sort of identifying those opportunities where you know community land is available. Because I think that that's actually one of the areas we're looking now to is like with these community housing providers, where's where's the opportunity there? Um, just because in some cases you have community housing providers who have larger tracts of land and there may be some interesting things you can do there. But coming back to your question, I think, yes. So I think the, the nature of allied seas is that it's inherent, it's very secure from the municipality's perspective, um, at least in our case, in the sense that, you know, it's, 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 on, the, it's on the tax roll, you know, that it, it's tied to the property. So, and, you know, in our experience to date, we've had really no issues with repayment. We're not talking about tens of thousands of properties, um, but our, it's, it's been very secure. And we've had, you know, eligibility criteria that are also, I think, kept it secure. Um, but, you know, that money, once it's beginning to flow back in, yes, in theory, you could start loaning it back out. And it's sort of figuring out what's that sweet spot where, you know, if you had 20 million, you had 100 million, at what point do you have, you know, five years into repayment, we start cycling that money back out. Um, so I think that's certainly um, something that could be done. Um, and again, you know, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities is launching through the Community Efficiency Fund a whole suite of these programs across the country. Again, right now, very much focused on energy efficiency and decarbonization. But I think the 2.0 version of that will be really interesting to see. Um, and again, you know, I think it's, you know, how much it's going to require a lot of money. Um, so if we can make that money secure, if we can make the government as an investor in this feel secure, um, I think there could be certainly some opportunities for making this money to revolve and, and, and you know, become like a Swiss army knife, do lots of things all at once, decarbonization, density, aging in place, affordability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, so I think there's a lot of interesting experiments happening right now. And like I said, the 2.0 version is going to be really interesting. I love that. I love the army knife version of that. Um, Marcel, so earlier you walked us through how the current options pencil out. And I'm just wondering what you think, like, let's go back to this issue of uptake. I keep looking back at California and how they were able to scale um, to 20% of their new housing supply coming from ADUs. What do you think, and they did it in five years, so what do you think it would take? You know, we've, and, and, and I want to sort of put aside the things that we talked about in the first two webinars, because the first webinar we talked about bringing down construction costs. So let's assume we've got those repeatable designs and the costs are down. And the second webinar we talked all about the barriers, the building code, the bylaws, 
any of the things that stand in the way and say no. So assuming we've got those solved, like how do we get to the next level? What's the next thing? This is what we're trying to do here in this panel is we're trying to figure out how do we incentivize this in some way and focusing on those homeowners who have those properties, they want to age in place, they want to unlock, they, they, a HELOC's like 7% right now. Like what are the ways that we can incentivize these owners in these houses throughout our landscape? It's an untapped housing supply. What's the next thing? Yeah, no, um, great question. Once again, a bit loaded, but let's see if we can take a stab at this. Um, my my whole thing is, and and I'll you know I'll give credit to what Grace stands up to. I think she nailed it, and, and I'm going to go go down that rabbit hole is innovation, right? And testing and piloting. Um, you know, I learned this fourplex and multi-unit stuff the hard way, right? And that was the old the old way. And um, you know, I found a mentor. Right. And, um, you know, in exchange for the mentor to teach me, I helped them do things like I was good at designing logos and graphics and that kind of stuff. And I did their marketing for them and they taught me how to buy and turn things into multi units. So I think if when I think about that and I think about scaling, not everyone's going to go off the deep end like I did and, you know, like go all in um, and try to figure this out. So I think there's a huge like educational kind of mentor-esque component that needs to happen with the average day citizen. And, you know, just to, to go back to what Kira said, like, you know, like community development versus this, you know, individual kind of, you know, do this on your own citizen developer or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, there, there's a big part of this that really changed the trajectory of my life, being able to own something in a way where, you know, I bought, I lived in the basement initially, while I renovated the upper units slowly, and then I got to move into the, the, the one on the main floor and rented out the basement. So there, they, like that whole process, um, sure, it was, you know, it was, it was hard and there was a learning curve, but it literally changed the trajectory of what I could do now that I achieved ownership. And I think that's something special for the individual and the family. And I think you can do both. I don't think it has to be an either or. Um, you know, the, the, the individuals that are developing community projects, they're pretty sophisticated. They know what they're doing. Um, really what I like and, and where I get excited is about empowering the individual to, you know, kind of carve their place. Um, and, you know, not every, not own, ownership's not for everyone. Um, you know, there's some regulatory challenges around, you know, condominiumizing and strata title. If we can get through that, that'll make it a lot easier, like Grace Ann said. But in the interim, there's a opportunity for maybe people to come together and do a fourplex, like be creative with things. Um, there's a, there's um, some really cool concepts that, you know, known as rent to own or lease to own um, that can be implemented. So I think it's, I think it's taking a look at this from an innovative way and really like, how do we, when I say we like the universities and individuals like me and, and whoever it is, like educate the individual owner to be able to make a quick decision um, so that when you see that property, you know exactly the risks that are involved and you can make a, an informed decision, right? Like, okay, yeah, I can do that one. Can't do that one over there, but, you know, over there, maybe in Scarborough, it's possible, right? Um, so, so I think these are the, for me, that's, that's the starting point. Um, it's, it's really like educating and like this kind of, um, you know, mentor in your pocket, maybe um you know from an innovative standpoint um you kind of see where i'm going with this but but that's that's really where i i, I see the the starting point yeah i know that grayson mentioned um adu search which kind of does that hey like it exactly yeah. like that's the start right yeah. yeah and can i riff on that for just one second because i sure. i'm noticing now that the whole premise of this conversation is that there needs to be some kind of financial incentive and I will say that from my experience, I have witnessed on the ground and I continue to witness on the ground that a lot of people that are doing this are doing this because they care about their communities or they care about a person or they care about a building. And I don't think that we have nearly tapped that market. Um, like Marcel is saying, to educate and enable and grow capacity in people that really just care about the place that they live. And they see this as really important for there to be grocery store clerks that live in their neighborhood. I don't think we've even scratched the surface of that. Like this stuff is barely legal. 
barely legal in most places. So, and, and most banks don't know how to lend on it, right? Um, credit unions are leading the way, but this is, we've, we've really barely scratched um, the surface of people that want to do this and are willing to make it happen at a financial loss because they care about, there's, they have other goals, right? They, they are housing someone that they love um, or, yeah, it's, it's, you know, they're learning. They're like Marcel was talking about, they're like improving themselves. And so um, I think that there's a huge opportunity there before we get into what money can we give people to do this? Yeah, right, I, I, I just want to, I want to echo that. I love that. So Marcel, thanks for telling that personal story because um, I think that's a, that's a very different motivation. Um, and and I, it feels like a better motivation to me and uh you know we talk about how, like financial incentives but but are there are there other are there other more creative ways of incentivizing folks to leverage the assets that they have for community outcomes that's a very interesting line of inquiry and then the other thing that i'll just throw into the mix is uh instead of incentivizing you know sometimes uh, we've seen some this is I I feel like I'm like the provocateur today, but um we've seen some 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 disincentives like so when you tax what you don't want, right? So what does it look like if you tax a single family homeowner who is not applying? Uh, to at least legalize a, a, a secondary unit in their home, what what would that look like? <laughs> I love that idea. I think yeah, it's I had yeah. this I had this one or just one one quick thing. This one other really kind of idea that came to mind. Like, what about like on that note, um, Kira, to help avoid some of the unintended consequence? Um, you know, what about making it, you know, really and there's a question in here that that in the in the chat, what about making it really um, um like a huge incentive for individuals that maybe owner occupied these units? to maybe, and maybe there's a capital gains incentive. So it's not today, but maybe it's in the long term. Um, so there's, you know, there's no capital gains maybe on the rental component of your, of your yeah, property. Or a property tax right? deferral might be another Which one, you right? Can, like you're adding you value really add to your home right? by adding an ADU. What would it look like if you weren't taxed on that for 10 years? Exactly. So the types of tax incentives or any of the type, maybe you don't want to call them incentives, but maybe they're um, ways to encourage um, the homeowner who lives there, who wants to age in place, who doesn't want to have to take out a, a HELOC, right? So that those are the benefits of, of the aging in place, of um, you know providing options for other people as well, right? So that's all good community stuff and for for the the um, the homeowner, but they might not, and this gets back to your point about education. Grayson, it's, they might not know about this, right? Like they think their only options are to take a HELOC or to sell their home and go live out of their community. So having those types of um, incentives um, or for financial supports um, to help people because, you know, we often hear, oh, they need to leave their big homes so we can make those available for other people. Well, wouldn't it be great if there's a way um, for them to stay and create units for others. Um, are there any final thoughts on that? Like things to get us yeah. to the next level so that um, just, more homeowners can do that. Maybe just really quickly, kind of, and I think it's a riff on what everyone else has said, but it's a, it's a it, access to information or the ability to access information and programs is a privilege, right? And so there needs to be some degree of navigation out there. And, and we're seeing this again in the sort of green spaces, concierge, that you need people to help you navigate that. Because even someone like myself who's in this space, I find these things difficult to navigate, as I'm sure all of the, you know, the experts on this panel do as well. So, you know, what is the concerted effort that happens around reducing the friction, making the navigation of this easier? So, Again, I, I love the point that everyone made. We're seeing a lot of people that are taking on these deeper retrofits, not because it's ultimately going to be cheaper, but they believe in the carbon equation. And I can guarantee you they also agree in the sort of community aspect, the housing piece of this. Um, but it, we, we need to find ways on math to make it to make it easier to navigate the process. That's the HGTV show that we need, right? <laughs> How to build an ADU. <laughs> yeah, good idea. Love it. I agree. Yeah. Yes. 
Um, uh, there's Richard. I'm going to ask Richard if he has any um, last minute Q and A's from the audience. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of questions here. Um, and um, as mentioned at the beginning, we'll be have taking an opportunity in the final written report to address many of them that don't get addressed now, which will probably be very few. Um, I, I will say that, that the top question um, is probably something we need a tax lawyer for, not probably on the panel, but it is, uh, um, would having an income generation generated, it would have income generated through renting part of your personal home affect capital gains exemption when the property is sold? I don't know if any of you know the answer to that. You do? Okay, Marcel, jump on. Okay, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this like, Full disclosure, I'm not a tax accountant and you should speak to your tax accountant, but I'm going to speak just from my personal experience. So so you are, and this was one of the points in my kind of crazy idea I was coming up with, right? So absolutely. So when you live in a um, in a multi-unit, um, you you have to determine with your accountant what portion of the, of the property is owner-occupied, right? Um, so if your unit that you're living in is 25% of the entire um, building, then that portion of capital gains will be um, the the idea is that portion is is will go on tax because in fairness you're bringing in revenue from the from the re remaining seventy five percent so that has to be taxed accordingly so so this is um, you know definitely speak to your accountant about how to do this the other thing you want to do is if you do choose at some point to move out um, one smart thing to do is to capture the value at that point um, so. You know, let's say you you know you bought the thing at whatever you know a million bucks and you did your thing and now it's worth two point five, um, and you move out at that two point five, get an appraisal then, um, just so you know if you decide to keep it, you know it may be at three million, you know in a few more years, right? So you you've captured your component of of uh, when you live there. Okay. Um, the, another question. Uh, the, the top question uh, was answered, I think, um, in part by a number of you, including Stuart's late last comments about where do you go to find out how to navigate all this? And I think the short answer is right now, that is still something that needs to be improved. Um, if I could answer that question directly, I think that's probably where everybody would agree. Um, there, there is a question, I'm going to skip over one, uh, which is more of a comment, uh, but lots of comments that uh, aimed at uh, you, Grayson, and uh, CMHC um, that you've probably seen. And again, we'll look at those in the final report. Um, rent control on auxiliary units. Um, uh, is that something that that uh, is a factor? Um, and um, maybe um, who wants to take that one? I don't know if that's a city question or or who. Well, I'll just I'll just point out that you know income qualifying, is a major undertaking and has a, a, a really sophisticated kind of ethical knife blade that you have to navigate. Um, and so, you know, trying to link that with a single family homeowner, I think opens a huge can of worms that frankly, I hadn't even thought of until you raised that question, Richard, but it's like, you know, part of the reason why um, below market rental housing is so well done by the nonprofit sector is because mm. they have absolutely professionalized um, uh, dignity and respect in the way that they are actually tying uh, the, 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 the eligible residents to the much needed um, stable, adequate yeah. homes that they're building. So it's a great, great question. I think it needs to be thought through. That's a super, super way to end this because I know Richard, you have to close this out, right? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Thank you. And I apologize uh, to our audience um, for having to do that because, uh, again, um, this was a session that flew by very quickly. So, uh, Cerise, thank you very much for your moderation. Uh, Kira, Grayson, Marcel, Stuart, uh, amazing, amazing panel. And it's just, I think, just really given us uh, increased our appetite to explore this more deeply and more urgently. Um, uh, there's just so, so much here, as we've discovered. Um, so if I could just get my uh, colleagues, I guess you have put up the slides here. Um, we have one final session, a uh, really important one tomorrow, where we look at the lens of equity, um, which is actually something that that is a great comment that uh, uh, Kira ended us on, because uh, that is going to get explored in much more detail tomorrow. So please tune into our final session. And then a very special treat uh, in the next slide, 
Um, there is a, a book uh, series, a book, sorry, uh, event um, that is in person. So we could maybe meet some of you actually in person and perhaps some of our panelists who are in Toronto might even attend this as well uh, for more uh, conversation. But the remaking of the American dream, the informal and formal transformation of single family housing cities. And you can see the author um, will be there. Um, that's tomorrow at the World Urban Pavilion um, in Regent Park at 6.30. Um, the registration link has been put into the chat. Um, so we hope that you will, uh, uh, if you can, attend this and meet a bunch of us uh, while we, when you do that. And with that, we'll tie things off with great thanks on time um, to everybody and to our audience. We'll see you tomorrow. I hope.